Hi, I'm Mike Ward. I want to give you a quick introduction to some of the issues that relate to valuing companies. Now, one of the main events that triggers the need to value companies is when they move from unlisted to listed companies. And uh, I thought I would show you a couple of examples. So Airbnb, and you can see the date here, 26 of February, 2020, so we're looking at uh, a bit more than a month ago now, and uh, you can see here's Elaine Moore writing uh, for the FT, and she's talking about the fact that some uh, startups, when you value them, are worth a lot and others not so much. But she quite likes the Airbnb listing. She thinks it's going to be a rare tech success, and she is the technology uh, guru. So, and her reasons are, first of all, she, she likes the boss. Co-founder and boss Brian Chesky inspires confidence. Unlike Travis Kalanick, the pugnacious founder of Uber or WeWork's bombastic co-founder Adam Newman. Yo, you should watch a few videos on Adam Newman. And so she likes the CEO. She also likes the fact that it isn't bleeding billions of dollars. Well, we'll see. And uh, she also likes the fact that the reason they're giving for going uh, public is that the early investors want to liquidate some of their shares. They don't really need the money, she says. Yeah, so they're doing what's called a direct listing. That makes life a lot easier because in the prospectus of a company that's listing, if you want to raise capital, which many companies do when they list, then you have to give a lot of details so people can figure out what the price is. But a direct listing means, you know, they're not raising capital. And so the price is formed when a willing buyer buys from a willing seller. And so it makes life a lot easier. So that's what she was thinking. But in today's FT, you can see Airbnb are in trouble. They've had to drop their valuation target by 16% to 26 billion. And if you read on down here, you can see they were hoping for 31 billion. And some people were even talking that it might be worth 40 billion at the end of last year. But life has been tough for them because suddenly there are no bookings. Bookings are down as much as 90%. So we're going to watch this one and see what happens. So here's another one. This is the We Company, Adam Newman's company. And you can see they also listed recently. And uh, well, this is, um, they were showing, gee, we are, our revenues are growing exponentially. But it's easy to grow revenues if you just spend more and more money. And investors were concerned because you can see if you just spend a lot of money on growing and marketing and you're making losses of $600 million every year, it's going to be a problem. It's easy to grow, but does it add value? Well, uh, when they wanted to list, the price range you can see was huge. And uh, so they had to, um, nobody knew whether this thing was worth 100 billion or whether it was worth like 20 billion and, and it, it ended up being much lower. And you can see here, this is looking at the price of their debt. So this is 100% of what it should be worth. And, and uh, then you can see they unveil their, their documents, everyone's happy, and then suddenly all kinds of problems. Adam Newman gets fired and SoftBank rescued this company and they've just declined to rescue it again because it's, you know, it's when you're making losses that big, it's a problem. Here's Uber. Uber listed almost a year ago and it was also showing losses. And uh, when it listed, it, it's, uh, it listed, you can see here at about $42 and its share price went up for a couple of months and then started to go down as they started to show the uh, losses that you can see in the latter quarter of 2019. Right now, Uber is listed, is trading somewhere down here at about half the price it listed at, 20, I think it's $23 today. So it's quite difficult valuing companies when they, when they come to market. Facebook's listing was particularly interesting. They listed eight years ago, and uh, it was a good time to list, actually. And uh, But when they valued the company, they valued it at 27 times its revenue. That was huge. 
normally one uses not revenue but profits to value a company and maybe seven or ten times 27 times revenue was huge but they said we're going to raise five billion they weren't actually looking for very much capital when they listed they said we need it our cash flow is fine we don't need it for operational purposes uh, we actually just need this five billion to pay our tax obligations arising from this listing and the reason they gave, gave for listing was not to raise cash, but was that they were fulfilling their commitments to employees and investors who, by going public. So the, until, they went, uh, until they listed, uh, people couldn't trade their shares. And uh, perhaps the most famous case of that was the graffiti artist who painted some graffiti at their request on the front of their building in their early days. And uh, he became an instant multimillionaire when they listed. So there were quite a few people like him who wanted them. Five hundred. That's the index trekking along nice and steadily upwards. When Facebook listed, and these this, these numbers are just indexed to give us a reading together, you can see their share price plummeted. And then went up and then dropped again. It dropped about 40% below what they'd listed it at. And it took three years before it actually caught up with the index again. After that, of course, it has done very well. And then there have been some issues uh, in the last couple of years about privacy and data and those kinds of things. So just a bit of background about why it's difficult to value companies. Now, there are really three methodologies that we use to value companies. The first is to look at what the accountants say the business is worth. We call that the net asset value. And that's because the assets on the balance sheet represent the value that has not yet been captured by the company. So the machines and buildings and, and uh, the receivables and the cash and so on are in the business. And... Uh, by subtracting the debt, that's why we are going to uh, call it the net asset value, we're going to see what the shares are worth. But that's not very commonly used, actually. Much more common is to use multiples. Just now I showed you Facebook. They were using a turnover multiple, a revenue multiple. Much more common than that, though, is to use a P-E ratio. You might have heard of that, and we're going to talk more about that a bit later. But sometimes people also use EBIT multiples or EBITDA multiples, and these are readily available benchmarks, very simple, easy to understand. But perhaps the most uh, accurate, uh, although it's highly technical, is the discounted cash flow methodology. And um, that is because shelters. Uh, are interested not in what was paid for the assets, but in the future cash flows they're going to generate. But then we have to be able to, act, to guess what they're going to be, and we have to discount them, which means we've got to work out a discount rate and so on. So we need to be clear, though, also what exactly are we valuing? Is it the entire enterprise? In other words, the whole business. So I'm calling that the value of the equity and the debt, the total business value which I'm showing you here with this arrow here, represents the value of the entire business. and Or is it sometimes what the uh, shareholders are interested in, the value of the equity? And we don't want to go too far down the track before we ask. Let's just be clear here. What are we valuing? The difference is easy to, to work out. Uh, if you are going from the equity value to get to the enterprise value, you just have to add the debt. And the, the value of the debt is generally uh, what you read on the balance sheet. So... When it comes to the net asset valuation, uh, it's relevant in certain instances, but as I said, we hardly ever use it. Sometimes it's a kind of lower limit in terms of negotiations. When shareholders look at the balance sheet of a company, they're not really interested in the assets. That represents what was paid for the business or for the assets, in fact. And, uh, they are interested in not what was paid because accountants measure cost, remember. They're interested in the future cash flows that these assets will generate. They want to discount all of those into the future, calculate the net present value, and that's going to give them not the book value of equity, which is what the accountants are saying, but something very much bigger than that. And there can be a very big difference between the book value and the market value. And to show you that, 
I have recorded here, these are the biggest 600 companies in Europe, and I've taken the market value uh, and divided it by the book value. So this is the number of shares times the share price. We sometimes call that the market capitalization. And this is what the accountants have recorded in the balance sheet as to being the equity value. Now, if these were the same, the market to book value would be one. But you can see here the median is 2.6. That tells us that the accountants are about 160% wrong. They're undervaluing the company dramatically. So you can see there are problems uh, with accounting, especially when we are interested in future cash flows. I hope you found that interesting, and we will pick that up with, another, uh, with a bit more detail later.